And good evening once more, ladies and gentlemen. We are now here for the second game of Cloud9 Eclipse versus ESC. My name is Henning, and with me is my lovely co-caster. Bunnington, hello, right. Um, so I've still got some slight issues with the Tournament Realm client. It's still updating, so I am going to be from uh, casting from the stream once again. But uh, Henning, has anything happened so far with picks and bans? We are just going into the band so far. Evelyn and Grangas being taken away by Cloud9, while ESC is taken away the LeBlanc from Forbidden and Cossacks, or, and Cossacks from Ku, of course. So, two great signature champions there from Cloud9's respective uh, players there. And I think Forbidden's Ari was really scary last game, so you don't really want to have him on an Iscari Assassins. But we do actually have the Lulu ban as the last one for ESC, so it's not going to be any ban on the Ari there. Anyway, the Gangplank as the last ban from Cloud9. I am a bit surprised by that. Do you, Have you seen any Gangplank as of late, Spunnington? Uh, no, I haven't <laughs> seen any. So I wonder if that was an accident or if it's a case where they just don't feel they need to ban anything, where they're quite happy leaving open as many champions that are powerful as possible so that it's like, well, we may as well get rid of this ban just in case they're running a super secret gangplank based strategy which i really I'm, I'm doubting that one yeah i would be doubting that too anyway we do have the renekton lock-in actually as the first pick for cloud nine counted by the lee sin and the thresh for esc so banning away the Cossacks and the evelyn and taking the lee sin away so ku is gonna be put on something that is maybe not entirely in his comfort zone not in his comfort zone, perhaps, but he's, he's the kind of player that can play quite a wide variety of champions, but it does limit his potential to snowball and carry a game, and that's the style we've seen from C9 quite a bit, actually. I think even in the Challenger Series Best of Five, there were several games where they took control of the early game and really just rolled on their momentum, so it is probably a good idea putting him onto a less snowball-y potential champion, but he's always going to be a threat. And that is actually the hover over the Aatrox from Cloud9. So it looks like we might have a throwback to somewhat of the older times with an Aatrox in the jungle. Not something we've seen uh, in a long time, but with Renekton and Aatrox, I would guess that it's going to be a jungle Aatrox. Or do you think it could be put in the mid lane, potentially? Potentially. It's not implausible to put Aatrox in the mid lane. He can actually function reasonably well against a lot of the squishier mages but you wouldn't want to blind pick it and you especially wouldn't want to pick Aatrox knowingly into a Renekton matchup because that could go terribly terribly wrong so you're probably right when you're saying it's most likely to be a jungle Aatrox which again yeah haven't seen that in a long time yeah anyway so there is the Renekton Aatrox and the Annie for Cloud9 versus the Thresh, Lee Sin, Lissandra, and it looks like the Ezreal here from ESC. So Lissandra, not a champion we've seen in a long time. Do you feel that we have a potential for somewhat of a counterpick to the Renekton in the top lane? Or is it just going to be a mid lane Lissandra? Well, Lisa, uh, Lissandra can work against Renekton reasonably well. But that's she. It's again. It's one of these matchups where Renekton is one of the only frontline style bruisers that can still function pretty well against her. Unlike something like Trundle, who can never get close. Renekton has the double dash. He has the stun. He has the burst and sustain. So it becomes much, much more difficult for Lissandra to survive that kind of lane. But then again, would you really want to blind pick a Lissandra into the mid lane? There are a lot of champions out there that just outrange and out harass her in these days. So it would be it would be an unusual pick, I think, regardless of where it's going. So it they clearly got something in mind. Yeah, absolutely. We do have a lot of damage and as potential from this under, but as you said, the short the short range is gonna be somewhat problematic. And we do actually have the Nidalee lock in here for Cloud9, so we are gonna see the Nidalee in the mid lane. The Aatrox in the jungle, I guess, with the Renekton in top and Nidalee and Annie in the bottom lane. So Nidalee and Caitlyn in, in combination here for Cloud9, who has been showing to have really good rotation and really good pushing historically. I think ESC is in for a tough one. Yeah, it's going to be very, very difficult to deal with that level of siege, assuming they get off the ground. But that's always the weakness when you're running stuff like Nidalee, and if you're running stuff like Caitlyn, if Nidalee doesn't get off the ground, or if Caitlyn gets her initial momentum kind of halted, 
then you can actually be in for some really serious times because in a seed situation where the enemy is the one with the minions to hide behind pushing up against your tower they're much much weakest much much weaker and wow there is a very interesting last pick here for esc with a talon so i believe we're gonna have the talon versus the needly in the mid lane and the lissandra versus the renekton in the top lane so some very unusual and extremely interesting interesting lane matchups coming out here for esc what do you think about talon in the current meta game especially versus someone like needly so Talon actually got changed like a couple of patches ago. They made it, they fixed his E so that it actually puts him behind his target like it was always supposed to. Against a really, really passive laner like Nidalee who can only really farm in the early game via auto attacks, Talon could be incredibly punishing because he gets so much damage so early on into the game that he can just jump on her and, you know, half health her at level 6 pretty easily or, or even more than that. So... That becomes very, very difficult for Nidalee to deal with. She has to try somehow to get farm in spite of being really, really bad at farming. And Talon, meanwhile, is free to go wherever he wants on the map. And he's a strong roamer. He's got a big dash, big silence, and big slow. So you've got to keep an eye out. And that's an unconventional champion, no doubt, but a potentially really huge one. Yeah, and all, those, all that said about these solo lane matchups, I think what I'm actually most excited about is going to be seeing how Ku is going to rock this jungle Aatrox as he has locked that in right now. So it's going to be really interesting to see what plays he can rate with, create with the Aatrox against the Lee Sin. Um, not sure how he's going to be able to do in the early duels, for example. I could see Lee Sin actually outpowering Aatrox in the early game. So Aatrox is a relatively weak uh duelist or in a situation where you've got to be concerned about burst but if you're talking about a jungle duel there's actually a little bit less burst available because if you think about most laners they'll actually tend to run ignite or they'll run a combat summoner that will give them a little bit of an edge obviously Lee Sin is going to be a stronger duelist in the early game but Artrux sustain may well help keep him high enough on health that he doesn't need to worry about being gibbed by Lee Sin coming out of a brush that he hasn't seen him in with that double Q combo and uh, just completely destroying him. So maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit more interesting than we would than you would typically expect because Lee Sin actually has quite a lot less sustained damage in the early game than you might think. Absolutely, we can actually see very interesting here for Ku going with the Doran's Blade start in the jungle as we have just gotten into this game. So it is going to be on the blue side. Cloud9 Eclipse, very scary team that took home game number one quite convincingly. Now up against ESC here on the red or the purple side. Gonna rock out here with the Lee Sin taking an offensive position in the jungle as Cloud9 is moving offensively very early here. On Warmness Renekton and Ku's Aatrox going in. Just getting some vision of it, but it looks like they are going to pull out, not to go for anything too aggressive here. And this is this is really typical Cloud9, Cloud9 Eclipse. Just go in very early, try to find a pick immediately, and then walk out before any real action has happened. Barely understandable. Both of these teams are actually reasonably strong in a level 1 fight, and that kind of cancels out, so it's a little bit less... Once you've been spotted, you don't necessarily want to go for a fight as easily, but... Uh, I am a little bit interested to know what Ku chooses to go for here. Is he going to play like a more aggressive uh, ganking or invading style? Or is he going to play it fairly defensively? Because his mid lane isn't going to be able to roam with him very easily. And is he just going to try and farm up Minions to be a sort of a later game threat and almost take over the role that Renekton will play in the earlier sort of uh, team fights? Absolutely. When we saw the Aatrox being played a lot in the jungle by the Chinese teams, for example, we did see some extremely aggressive plays going for the tower dives around level 3, as he is an extremely strong tower diver with his passive. So it's going to be really interesting to see, as you say, what Ku is going to be able to do here. He's going to start out with the blue buff, getting the leash from Oduamnes Renekton here. He's now going to go up to the top lane, where he will face the Lissandra. And actually very interesting here, going for the Doran's Blade is Oduamnes. So... Going with a very confident, almost a cocky start here against the Lissandra as he is not going to have any auto attack reduction that he would get from the Doran's shield, for example. So the Doran's blade start for Renekton is actually something that's been coming into fashion basically since the Doran's shield nerfs. 
And I think at this point, most people that play Renekton typically start with a Doran's Blade just because the stronger the Renekton is earlier on, the more he's going to be able to bully the enemy away from the creeps and force them onto the inferior item. And the stronger uh, Renekton gets to be in a one-on-one, -on -one, the more damage he has. So therefore, he's free to auto attack the minion, free to build up his rage and get his own sustain from his Q. So it makes sense on a number of different levels. And I think that's why we tend to see it more and more as time goes by. And wow, there must have been some sort of action here in the bottom part of the map that both me and the directed camera missed because Yanan is actually wearing the blue buff on the Caitlyn here. So must have gone in for some sort of steal on Caruso's blue buff. I did not catch that. I'm extremely sorry. But Yanan is going to be very, very happy with this as the Caitlyn that's able to spam your Qs for free how much you want. It's going to be extremely intimidating here for the ESC lineup. As Leeson is coming in for the roam to the bottom lane though, a great hook there from Ryman Simon, hooking in Yan and under the tower, is forced to flash away though, but Broki is going after with the Esriel, and I'm sure this is going to be first blood, and Esriel actually picking up the blue buff as well, extremely smart play from ESC there, spotting out that Caitlyn actually has the blue buff, and then just putting a huge target on the head, and getting the blue buff onto Esriel is perhaps the AD carry that's going to benefit most from the blue. Yeah, and also now going to have the XP advantage in the early game. I don't know how much damage he actually took in that in that uh, gank situation, but when he gets back into the lane and they end up fighting each other again, he's going to have the level advantage, he's going to have the blue buff advantage, and he's going to have a more aggressive support capable of getting all-ins and forcing them on the opponent. That is a really scary prospect to deal with. Yeah, and forcing Yarnam back to only pick up a second Doran's Blade while Brokis as well is going to be able to pick up at least a Vamp Scepter is actually quite a substantial advantage. And meanwhile, we, when all that happened, we actually saw a lot of action in the top lane here as Odwamnus Renekton went extremely offensive under the tower and actually dove KX and E picking up the, picked up the kill with Ignite and was able to just get away with a sliver of health and is now backed away picking up the pickaxe. So a great kill in the top lane for Odwamnus, but a good kill in the bot lane as well for ESC. So very even game so far with just a couple hundred gold ahead for ESC. And a very worrying sign for KSNG. If you fall behind a Renekton lane, it's going to get ugly fast because he snowballs incredibly hard. He, and Lissandra, she'll always be able to clear the wave. She'll always be able to keep her tower alive unless she gets dived. But that becomes very, very easy because you get Renekton at level 6 and he builds a bit of armor and he gets incredibly tanky and he dies. And um, with goes in again diver. here, extremely aggressive, and it actually saved the ignite from the earlier dive. Is it going to be enough to pick up the kill? No, KX and he is going to be able to get away, but we can just see that the Renekton with a pickaxe, just a normal EWQ combo with ignite, almost to KX and his entire HP bar down. I think he needs to buy a couple of cloth armors here, but no, actually goes for the boots, so KX and he not. Itemizing too defensively against the Ramnus Renekton, which is looking extremely scary so far. It's sort of an understandable gambit by KSNG. He's trying to be, make it make there, yeah, basically make it so he never has to trade with his opponent. And so with the boots, hope he's hoping he can always stay out of the double slice and dice range. But it's going to be very difficult. He's going to end up getting zoned out of at least some amount of farm as a result. But like I said, Lissandra's wave clear is going to be pretty solid. He may and while be able Forbidden to make it going in well. the mid lane, meanwhile, getting D-Man extremely low here, but not rocking the Ignite on the Nidalee, of course, taking the barrier. So D-Man actually overextending a small bit into a large minion wave. Forbidden has, had just hit level 6, going, went in with a Cougar form, and just managed to chunk D-Man down, forcing the flash away as well as the recoil. But here Caruso comes into the mid lane. No, does not want to take the fight with Forbidden. And Nidalee, with, with this Cougar form, is actually deceptively strong when she goes into that melee range. Yeah, she does a ton of damage when she goes in a melee range, especially if it's already a low HP fight, which it's likely to be because of her spears and because of her generally difficult to deal with nature. And I'm actually a little bit surprised, though, that Talon is the one falling behind early because he is typically considered a very, very strong early character and he should be able to play around that melee form. Absolutely, has been playing quite offensively here, trading aggressively with that rake, but it still has fallen 10 CS behind and as I, as we said, was forced to flash there. Has went for the triple long sword as well as the flask that he started with, but Forbidden has managed to get up his double Doran string as well as the tier of the goddess. But this is something that I think is quite a problem when playing the Nidalee. 
itemizing against an AD opponent becomes quite difficult, I think. Or at least I feel like, because the Athens just gives you everything you need and you can't really go it because the magic resist is wasted in this matchup. You can always go for it later on if you want, although that hits the same problems that a lot of uh, like Ryzen characters like Cassidy hit because they, it takes a long time to ramp up if you go for double mana items. But you're right, it does force you into a bit of an itemization trap. The only thing is though, going for a tier is arguably a better thing in the super long run because you get the stronger individual spears in the late game, you get massive amounts of AP from a finished Seraph's Embrace. Yeah, the thing about the Athens, I feel, is just you, you get cooldown reduction, you get mana, and you also get the defensive stat. But here, if Fabivan goes in as well, but Caruso is here with his Lee Sin. It's actually the flash from Fabivan is good, so he's able to get away. But a good counter gank there from Caruso was able to almost turn around that fight. But Fabivan was a bit too strong, and with that flash, had no problems getting away on Nidalee. Such a slippery character. It's always going to be hard to pin her down. Again, it's just the nature of the Nidalee, and that just makes it difficult but ESC need to do something in at least one of their lanes right now because yes bot lane is doing okay again but at least three minutes into the past again I'm casting from the stream Caitlyn in spite of losing that early blue buff is ahead on CS yeah Caitlyn is still ahead on CS by about 15 and here's actually the blue still coming in once more for cloud nine getting it onto Aatrox and they might want to go for dragon here as Aatrox at his level six and is popping that ultimate doing so much damage to dragon Voidal as well tanking it up with his Annie shield so this dragon is gonna just melt for cloud nine ESC not really staying on top of their vision and staying on top of their game in general having given up the blue buff the dragon as well as the top lane of KXNG being two levels behind and just having such a hard time against Orwam is now going in once more. I mean, this Lissandra is just having such a terrible time in this top lane. ESC really has to do something and I feel really it's up to Caruso's Lee Sin to make a play somewhere. This is potentially though a problem associated with trying to pick Lee Sin away from Ku is that they've ended up with perhaps Caruso not feeling entirely comfortable on that champion or they've ended up with lanes whether he doesn't feel entirely confident that they will have the support to enable his gank. So it's a difficult situation but Caruso definitely needs to do something even if it actually proves impossible to do so he needs to find the magic opportunity. Good play there in the top lane from Cakes and G, but here's some action in the mid lane as well. D-Man is popping the ultimate onto his talent here, but it looks like yeah, he might be able to get away. Here comes Caruso for the counter gank. He has a great Dragon's Rage, they're kicking back to Devin, and this is going to be one kill down onto Ku, but he is just going to respawn, and it might be the turnaround here for Devin. A very close fight as Demon goes in once more, picks up. Ku is actually going to be able to almost pick up Devin, but he gets away with a barrier, and that is a two for one in favor of Cloud9 in that two for two fight in mid. They're getting the better of more and more trades at this point. It's a very worrying sign, especially given we've already seen the first game. We already know how hard Cloud9 is to get off the get their jaws off of a victory once they've gotten that advantage from the early game. What a great play here in the mid lane. The roam from the Thresh and the Ezreal coming in actually is able to pick up the Divin there with the Mystic Shot as well as the Ezreal ultimate there is Brokey, so he's actually gonna get the double buffs as well that Nidalee in turn picked up from the Lee Sin and the Talon kill. So double buffs on Tesriel right now, a character that really enjoys both of them. So, I'm trying to take stock of the situation as things are. I feel like Cloud9 Eclipse, the, the, they're going to have a stronger late game as well. Like, I'm trying to look for that, that spot of hope in the situation for ESC Gaming, but can you really, I mean, from, from your perspective, Henning, can you see anything that really they have as an edge over their opponents? Maybe the ability to get catches with Lissandra and Talon on the same team later on? Yeah, I do feel that's probably the main advantage, but... They do really have a great line of assassins, I would say, with both Lissandra and Talon being able to really burst someone down. And with the with the potential Lee Sin engage, I guess that would be their way to come back in this game, finding a catch with the Lee Sin and then just bursting them down. But right now it seems quite hard as as Cloud9 is actually rotating offensively here into the mid lane, has ward up the top side of the jungle and are putting pressure onto the mid lane right now. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves as the kills are 4 to 4 and the gold is just or well, just 2.5k in favor of Cloud9 right now, so nothing is over so far. No, indeed, and we've seen that 
you know, teams can show some remarkable resilience. And teams like ESCs, where they have an Ezreal on it with the ultimate for wave clear, where they have the Talons W, the Sandra Q and E, they can really wipe waves and they can hold on for a long, long time and look for the right opportunity. But I definitely would like to see them starting to take a good amount of vision control in their own jungle and then perhaps later on look to move it towards the enemies. Absolutely, and here we do have the offensive play from Cloud9 going in with three members towards the red buff. But here comes Demon's Talon, it's just gonna get bursted down immediately Why the Tibbers as well as Ku jumping in. But they are actually, Cloud uh, ESC is actually doing a great job of forcing them away, going one for one so far, picking up the Annie as well as a great play there from Ryman Simons. Thresh doing a great job there with the hook and the box actually picking up Yanan as well. So a two for one trade in favor of ESC. When Cloud9 almost got overconfident, I feel they're going for the red buff with only three members. That is always a risk. Hubris softens the earth beneath the feet of victory. That is a, a difficult, uh, and it's difficult to deal with if you start to lose control of a game which you thought you had in the bag. It can really go messy. Absolutely, and I feel like with the offensive itemization choices here for uh, the Cloud9 team, we can also see Otto Amnig going down the top lane, but as I said, the offensive itemization choices with the rush to the Ravenous Hydra for Enekton actually upgrading his Tiamat fully before doing getting any sort of defensive items. We'd also have the Frost Fang as well as the Phoenix Codex from the Ann here from Voidal, so it looks like he's just gonna go for the Frost Queen's claim before even the Sidestone as they are diving towards Demon in the mid lane, but Demon is gonna get away. Anyway, what do you think about offensive itemization choices here for Cloud9? Do you feel like this might come back to bite them as they are playing very confident? Yeah, actually, I, I really do. That is an unusual choice because what you typically want against a team like ESC is you want someone tanky. You want someone who can face check brushes without needing to be too concerned. And Renekton's now going to take quite a long time to get that tanky. And that can cause you problems. That means he is a viable target to be picked off by the enemy. And that gives them more outs, that gives them more ways back into the game. It did, however, allow him to punish Lissandra even harder than he would have been able to anyway. So arguably, the, the Tiamat and the Hydra is part of why he's ahead at the moment. But I at least don't see why he's bothered to upgrade the Tiamat into the Hydra itself. Absolutely, and we can see here in the mid lane, Forbidden has upgraded his Archangel stuff. And that is just about to be fully stacked 715 of the 750 stacks that is required. We can already see one spear doing half of Thresh's, of Ryman Simon's Thresh HP there, and one other spear might land if of a Divin, no, but these spears are getting extremely scary with just one item here from Nidalee, and this is exactly what you mentioned with the, uh, with the Archangel stuff here as it's getting fully stacked. It is a super high AP single item. That is what you really definitely can say for it. And arguably against ESC's lineup with the double assassins, that's going to, the shield effect is going to be very, very useful as well. But here comes the engagement in the mid lane for uh, Caruso jumping in here with his lease in, but Ku coming in with a counter engage as well as the ace in the hole there for Yanan. But here comes D-Man from the side. Is actually going to go for the burst on two for Vivian. Is it going to be enough? No, it's going to get away with the barrier and with a great roam from Ottawa and this reaction from the top lane. That is going to be one turret and a kill for Cloud9. So they are just snowballing their advantage here. A great attempt at the snipe there with the Truce of Barrage from Brokey, but it's not going to be enough. And Cloud9 gets out with a tower, a kill, and perhaps even a top tower here. Great play from Cloud9 so far. Really utilizing their early game, or the sort of early game composition here with the Caitlyn and the Renekton. Taking down, having taken down five towers so far in only 16 minutes. Yeah, that's scary stuff already. And you can see, I can tell you that it's in the next three minutes they're going to take three towers. Because, uh, or oh, sorry, in the last three minutes they took three towers. Because I'm of course watching from the stream, so I'm three minutes behind. And that's, uh, that's a really, really fast pace to take your towers and that that kind of lead can snowball very very quickly it also increases the gold lead and it gives you so much map control you then get the vision control and then it becomes so trivial to move between the lanes to rotate between the lanes and create manpower advantages in specific spots the action continues though as demon picks up on the actually not that tanky with this reaction build and demon is going on to janan as well but janan is going to be able to get away however a great one for one trade as well as we had a, another one for one hit earlier with Lissandra and Aatrox both going down. The thing with all this is that the kills and assists are going into Broke's Ezreal. So this Ezreal is now 4-0-2, having picked up the um, uh, Trinity Force as well as the Vamp Scepter 
So this Ezreal is actually, yeah, right now sitting on almost as much gold as Diana's Caitlyn. So an Ezreal with a Thresh support, that's going to be really hard to kill in the later stages of the game. No doubt at all, but this is the thing again. Do C9 EU, C9 Eclipse ever need to directly kill Ezreal when they have some incredibly good sieging potential? Nidalee gets her farm up, Nidalee gets her uh, stacks up on her Archangels, and then her spears start heading for half health. You force them away from the tower, or you force ESC to engage on you, and then it becomes a lot easier to just pin him down and get the kill on that. So maybe they won't ever try to but again this is the thing about hubris they may well choose an engage they don't need to take a c9 absolutely and c9 are just keeping taking control of the jungle here picked up the blue buff on the esc side of the map but you might as well call that cloud9's jungle as well they are pushing down to the, the mid inhibitor turret and esc only have three members here so this turret is gonna go down especially as one Italy spear lands onto Ezreal. so this tower goes down let's see if Cloud9 wants to go for it, or if they just want to siege with this Caitlyn, I think, or with the Caitlyn and the Nidalee. I think just walking around the turret and waiting for a couple of spears to land is a great, would be a great choice. But as for Bevin is out of mana, they are going to recall and just leave ESC alone for a bit more time. That is one of the issues with the Seraphs, though. Again, as compared to the Fiends, you have no, almost no regen at all, so you're very dependent on the blue buffs. At the moment, that's fine to see Naeu because they're keeping control of their own jungle. If they ever lose that control, if they do, you know, throw a hubristic fight, then it becomes a much bigger problem because they start to fall behind and they wow, start to and lose Wow, and Demon the goes on to Yannan in the mid lane, seeing this Caitlyn completely alone, but Demon does not dare go for it. However, this is what I think this ESC team has to do. They have to find picks, and they found a Yannan, Caitlyn alone in the mid lane. Demon went for it, didn't, wasn't quite able to pick it up, and now the siege is going to continue as Talon is not in position. Uh, KX and G's Lissandra is also getting focused here and this is probably going to be an inhibitor for Cloud9 without any trouble. Although the Threshold lands, are they going to go for the fight here? Now it looks like they are just going to give up the inhibitor for free. Cloud9 takes this with uh, just utilizing somewhat of a mistake that maybe from Demon's Talon and are now going away. One more interesting note to see here is that, Kate, uh, this, that Nidalee, as we said, had only the Seraphs and two Doran's Rings went back and bought a straight Ravenous Deathcap. So this is going to be quite scary for ESC. Yeah, what do you do when the spears chunk you for that much? But you're already losing team fights for when you can get them as well. So well, here comes the desperate losing. engage from TXNG. He is going in with his E ulting himself and then following it up with these Zonias doing a lot of AoE damage onto the entire C9 team. But there they take down Kicks in the end. I think that's somewhat of what ESC had to do there. They had to go for Desperate Engage, but it wasn't enough. Yes, Adwam actually flashes in onto three people completely alone. It's going to go down, but Cloud9 is just playing so extremely confident right now. And as 20 minutes have been passed, I would not be totally surprised to see the Surrender Vote coming out anytime soon. So just domination from Cloud9 so far. <coughs> Although not in the kill department. 11 to take... <laughs> 11 to 10 kills. <laughs> Are you alright? <laughs> uh, I'm fine, no problem. Alright, I, I wouldn't want you to kill yourself casting here, because uh, I know you did say your voice was, was was suffering a bit, and then you had to, well, practically solo cast, so uh, if you if you need to take a moment, do feel free to do so. I can tell the, guy, I can tell the guys uh, who are watching, by the way, my tournament client currently says 552 hours left remaining to update on 90%. Okay, yeah. That's never a good thing. I believe my voice should be somewhat fine now. At least that's what I'm hoping for. So you I guess hope. you can always hope. So we are going back into this game here as Cloud9 are pulling up. Has one inhibitor down so far. Did not manage to take down the second one, but they are just going to go back, pick up a dragon, pick up some farm in the top lane as well as their own buffs. So just farming up here as we do actually have the Blade of the Ruined King now completed onto Ku's Aatrox along with the Warden's Mail and the Spirit of the Elder Lizard. So, somewhat of a hybrid build, but almost a bit more towards the damage side with the Blade of Rune King. A bit interesting that it goes for it, even though we have no real health stackers on the team of ESC. It's a very, very solid item on Artrox in general, though, because he likes the sustain and he loves the attack speeds for, for his W. So, it kind of synergizes with his kit so well that the fact that it's maybe not going to be utilizing the percent damage as optimally as it could is, you know, not not, not something that's really going to upset him too much. But 
I would say right now, though, the fact he's able to afford to buy that on a jungle budget is kind of an alarming sign. Absolutely, and we can see here some more items being completed. Sunfire Cape onto the Renekton, as well as a lot of scary things here. And we do see WoW and other engaged here, as actually Cloud9 is grouping up for the Baron. Yes, he went in for the face check, but wow, they are getting so punished for it. Lissandra goes down. Lee Sin might go down here. No, they're actually getting away. Oh, there is the ace in the hole, though. So two kills, actually three kills going down for Cloud9 as they set up for the Baron. And they just laid him wait in the bushes, waited for the face checks. And here it looks like Broke is actually going to go down as well. A four for zero, clean sweep for Cloud9. And I believe that is going to be game. A great Baron bait set up by Cloud9. Wow, uh, uh, it's a remarkable <laughs> thing they've managed to end two games in a row. Pretty much in a state where, from my perspective, three minutes into the past, it looks like maybe ESC could try and sort of vaguely know, okay, they're miles behind. But in the situation, you've got to say Cloud9 Eclipse have shown themselves once again to be a really, really strong team in the EU Challenger Leagues. Absolutely, Cloud9 showing off the potential really in these kind of games where they can take an early advantage and they can really snowball i would say that is they they definitely do have lcs potential in their lane mechanics and when it comes to snowballing the thing is that it's always going to be very difficult to know what to do when behind and that's going to be a completely different game the other thing of course is that ku is too young for the lcs you actually saw, I believe, in the Riot Challenger series most recently, Cloud9 Eclipse weren't running uh, with Ku. They were running with a different jungler. I think it was Hilberto, I think. Um, and I don't, I don't want to say that they looked lost without him, but they weren't. They didn't work in the same way. So it could be a long, long time before we actually see this particular group of people in the LCS. They, uh, they just have to deal with that problem unless they can find some other amazing jungler from the eu series you know challenger scene that is over the age and has a similar play style and meshes with the team in the same way you know it's such a complicated thing uh to deal with but you know that's life absolutely that is indeed life anyway i believe that is a pretty quick 2-0 for cloud9 both games in total going for going on for about 43 minutes i believe so, yeah, quite a quick best of three here as Cloud9 takes it home. And I believe that is it for us for this evening. Yes, and uh, hopefully if, if, if I am to be casting some of the later parts of the Riot Turkey International Invitational, I'll have my tournament client updated. I will leave it to finish this evening and log on, test it all works. And uh, hopefully, hopefully that won't be a problem in the future. But, uh, guys, it has been a pleasure to cast for you today. Uh, I am Spuddington. Um, if you have liked my casting, feel free to follow me on my Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash Spuddington. And my co-caster was Henning, who I believe is... Actually, wait. Are you... Are you, are you Henning? I can't remember. What? Oh, sorry? Uh, on, do you have a Twitter? I forget. I do have a Twitter, and it's at... Uh, okay, it's more towards the Swedish audience, and it's, it is my name, Henning underscore Eklund. So if you want to oh, practice God. your <laughs> Swedish spelling... Get on Twitter and uh, go follow me if you enjoyed what you've seen. Otherwise, just uh, write something in the chat or something. I will be checking that out when I am done with this. It was a pleasure to cast as well, even though my voice somewhat gave up there for a short while. It was I still had a great time watching Cloud9 somewhat dominate this game. Yeah, they, they really are an amazing team to watch, and it's a lot of fun to see them play. But regardless... We're just going to be going, I believe, now until tomorrow, because I believe there should be some more tomorrow. Hexit, who is our producer? Oh, yeah, we've got reruns of today coming up after this. So, guys, don't go anywhere. Stick around. Keep watching. We will be back with reruns in a sec.